Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Trace. In this video, we will focus on change of basis. Let's start by reviewing our familiar notation. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. V will denote a finite dimensional non-zero vector space over F. Note that we are no longer assuming that V is an inner product space. Let's review some definitions about matrices that I'm sure you've seen before. Suppose N is a positive integer. The N by N identity matrix is the diagonal matrix shown here, consisting of ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. We denote this identity matrix by i. It would be possible to include n in the notation, but the value of n should always be clear from the context. Also, note that we're letting i denote the identity matrix, and i also denotes the identity operator. Again, which meaning is intended should always be clear from the context. A square matrix A is called invertible if there is a square matrix B of the same size such that A times B and B times A are both equal to the identity matrix I. We call B the inverse of A and denote it by A raised to the minus one power. In this video and in the next few videos, we will be making major use of the notion of the matrix of an operator. Thus, let's review that definition. Suppose T is an operator on V and we have two bases, V1 up to Vn, and w1 up to wn of v. The matrix of T with respect to these bases is the n by n matrix whose entries are defined by the equation shown here. If the bases are not clear from the context, we use the notation where we display them explicitly, but if it is clear from the context, we can just write m of t. The picture shown here can help you understand what's going on. We write the first basis, v1 up to vn, on top of the matrix. And we write the second basis, w1 up to wn, on the left side of the matrix. As shown here, we're also displaying the vector vk, the kth basis vector in the first basis, and the kth column of the matrix. You can think of that kth column of the matrix as follows. Apply t to the kth basis vector vk. So we get a vector t of vk, which of course is a linear combination of w1 up to wn. Those coefficients needed to write t of vk as that linear combination become the kth column of the matrix, as you see from the equation displayed here. As a simple example, if the two bases are the same, then the matrix of the identity operator is equal to the identity matrix. Make sure you verify that. Throughout these videos and throughout the book, I've taken the attitude that we start with an operator on some vector space, and then we try and find a basis for that vector space, such that the matrix of the operator has a nice form. For example, we might try to get upper triangular form. In my opinion, this viewpoint is the most productive way to approach linear algebra. But now we need to shift our viewpoint a little bit and think about how the matrix of an operator changes as we change bases. Let's start this process with a review of the formula for the matrix of the product of two operators. The setup now is we have two operators, S and T, on V. And we have three bases, U1 up to UN, V1 up to VN, and W1 up to WN. Then the matrix of S times T is equal to the matrix of S times the matrix of T, where one has to be careful about the bases involved. They are as shown in the equation here. The reason this equation holds is that we chose the definition of matrix multiplication to force this equation to be valid. Here is the first new result that we will need. Suppose we have two bases, u1 up to un and v1 up to vn, of our vector space V. Then we have two possible orders to form the matrix of the identity matrix with respect to these two bases. 
This theorem says that those two matrices are inverses of each other. Let's look at the proof of this result. In the equation above, replace the wj's with the uj's. To help you see what's going on, the wj's are now in red, and in a second they're going to change to uj's. There they are with uj's now. Now make another substitution in the equation above. Replace s and t both with i, the identity operator. Right now the s and t are in red, and in a second they will both turn to i's. Now we have a new formula, and if we think about that, on the left side we have the matrix of the identity with respect to uh, the bases u1 up to un, and the second basis also u1 up to un. So on the left side we get the identity matrix. And then I've just repeated what we get on the right side below, now in red. If we interchange the roles of the u's and the v's, we get the product in the other order. This proves the result that these two matrices are matrix inverses of each other. Now we are ready to prove the change of basis formula. We'll start by redisplaying the formula for the matrix of the product of two operators, because we will need to use it a few times. Here is the change of basis formula. Suppose we have an operator t on our vector space v. And suppose we also have two bases of v, u1 up to un, and v1 up to vn. We let a denote the matrix of the identity operator with respect to the bases u1 up to un and v1 up to vn. We are interested in a formula that connects the matrix of t with respect to u1 up to un with the matrix of t with respect to v1 up to vn. Notice that for the last two matrices, we only mentioned one basis for each matrix. That means we are using that basis for both slots with respect to that matrix. Here's the formula. The matrix of T with respect to the basis U1 up to UN is equal to A inverse times the matrix of T with respect to the basis V1 up to VN times the matrix A. Thus, this formula gives us a very nice way to get from the matrix of t with respect to one basis to the matrix of t with respect to another basis. Let's look at the proof of this formula. In the result above, replace the wj's with the uj's. The wj's are highlighted in red right now, so you can focus on them, but in a second they will be replaced with uj's. There we go. Now they've turned into uj's. And now replace the s above, there are actually two cases of it, with the identity operator i. So the st will become just t, and the s in red will become i. There we go. Both of those changes have been made. Now we get the equation shown below. Notice that above we have the matrix of t with respect to the bases u repeated twice, so we just write it once in red now, down below. And the matrix of i with respect to v1 up to vn and then u1 up to un is the inverse of the matrix A. That's by the result we discussed on the previous slide. And then we have the matrix of t with respect to the u's and the v's. So this gives us the equation now shown in red. Uh, if you need to think about that and make sure all the, you followed all the steps, please pause the video. Now let's go back to our original um, equation at the top for the matrix of the product of two operators. And this time I want to replace the w's with the v's. So the w's are now in red, but in a second we'll replace them with v's. There we go. And now I want to replace the t with i. t occurs twice. Once is st, so that'll become just s. And the last time is t, now in red. That'll become the identity operator in a second. There we go. We've made that change. And now let's replace the remaining s with t. So you see two s's in red. In a second, they will re be replaced with t's. There we go. And so now we have the equation shown here. The matrix of t with respect to the u's and the v's is the matrix of t just respect with respect to the v's 
times the last matrix, which by the definition in the change of basis box to the left is just the matrix A. Now, substitute the previous equation into the one above it, getting the desired result in the change of basis formula. Again, pause the video to make sure you can follow all the steps. This completes the proof of this result. This concludes part one of the video on trace. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of linear algebra done right in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.